Welcome to Elysium Theatre Company's Durham Shakespeare Festival podcast 2023. Recorded with Durham University to mark the 400th anniversary of the publication of the first folio, we present interviews with some of the leading Shakespearean actors and scholars in the UK. I'm Jake Murray, Artistic Director of Elysium Theatre Company, and with me are Head of Conservation Tony King and Rare Books Curator Danielle Westerhoff of Durham University. Tony, Danielle, thanks for joining us. Let's start with if you could just let us know a little bit about what began your fascination with history and and what your interest is in the first folio and its history. Tony, do you want to go first? So uh, in my role at Durham, as I'm head of conservation for the the collections here, uh, the first folio comes under my care, but within uh, special collections. So um, I'm really interested in the physicality of the book. Um, Obviously, this is a book with huge cultural significance. but particularly with the Durham first folio uh, that has particular conservation needs, how you go about caring for something that people feel so strongly about. Lovely. And Danielle? Yeah, so uh, I'm the Rare Books Curator at Durham University, and um, a bit like Tony, uh, the first folio is one of many books that I help to look after. Um, Like Tony, I'm, I'm interested in the materiality of the book, but I approach it very much from a book historical point of view and a curatorial point of view. Um, I basically, by training, I'm a librarian, so I'm, I'm slightly different. Um, you know, I have a slightly different professional background from, from Tony, obviously, as, as conservator. And although I have a, a degree in English literature, I have no specific expertise in, in Shakespeare. Um, so my interest in the first folio is, is very much a very significant book in the history of books. Um, and I'm really interested in, in how uh shakespeare related to other kind of actors writers in in the period fascinating perhaps daniel you can say a little bit more about that i mean there was something like uh, what um seven years between uh the publication of the first folio and the death of shakespeare um can you say a little bit tell us a little bit about why it took so long um or why there was that gap or why even there was a decision to to create a first folio I think that's quite interesting. Um, I couldn't quite explain the gap. I think you would need to ask a a first folio expert this, but my feeling is it was such a big undertaking and um, so many people were involved. So many permissions had to be sought to publish plays that had been previously published. Um, It just took a really long time to pull it all together. There was an initial attempt in 1619 to create a similar work of all of Shakespeare's plays. So that never really got off the ground. So um, 1623 is really kind of the first official publication of most of of Shakespeare's dramatic works. Was it common to print um, the complete works of a playwright at the time, one of of many who were writing at the time, and obviously preeminent and very popular, uh, but we don't have the complete works of Webster in a folio edition or a complete works of Marlow, I don't think. No, we don't. It was very unusual. Plays were were obviously created for the stage. You know, they were meant to be performed. They were not necessarily meant to be published. And although you get quite a lot of quarto-sized plays, so kind of pamphlet-sized plays being published around the time of the first performances of, of dramatic works, most plays would just disappear. They would they would not be circulated among a wider audience. Shakespeare's works wasn't actually the first complete edition, if you like, of the plays in 1616, so the the year of Shakespeare's death. Ben Jonson self-published, if you like, his plays and poetry that he'd written up to that point. So Ben Jonson is really the first kind of creator of, of dramatic works, if you like, who published in a large format his own work. And it may be that Shakespeare's friends and, and admirers took that as an example to publish their own folio um, a few years later. And of course, Johnson himself was part of that process, wasn't he? And of course, we forget that in those days, the kind of theatre that Johnson and Shakespeare and Marlowe were writing was quite a new art form. Um, in England, that the literary art forms were seen as basically poetry uh, in the classical mould and that theatre was very much um, a new sort of popular upstart kind of art form. And there were no novels in those days either. No, I think that's really interesting. And I think it's also quite interesting that Shakespeare was first of all known as a poet. So he made his name as a poet. It was only later that people realised he actually wrote some really good plays as well. So you're absolutely right. Going to the theatre became popular sort of around 
the late 16th, early 17th century, you know, it became fashionable to go to the theatre. And all of a sudden, you see then also this rise in the number of plays being circulated in kind of cheap format, if you like. Daniel, I wonder um, how significant do you think it is that this is a folio? I mean, by, by folio, we mean this is it's the largest book you can make from uh, a sheet of paper. So it would be quite unusual for plays to be produced in such a large and expensive, very expensive format. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, when you think about uh, kind of production, books in that in that era, in around 1600, had to be kind of handcrafted almost. So it took a very long time to print a book that size. It was huge investment that you would not see any benefit of until you've sold your first book. So it required a huge amount of capital. And I think this is partly why it took so long to publish this this book as well, because a lot of money had to be upfronted by various backers to get this folio off the ground. It was printed in 750 copies approximately. And yes, as, as Tony said, it was hugely expensive. It retailed bound in car for about one pound, which seems nothing you think about as in today's money, but it was the equivalent of an average labourer's wages for a year. So one pound was, was quite a significant investment in a book to purchase. And that's very interesting because, as we've discussed on some of the other podcasts, Shakespeare's audience was primarily unlettered. I wouldn't have been able to afford to buy something of that cost. And although Shakespeare obviously attracted nobility and, and the middle class merchant class and also the monarchs, by far they were the only ones who really could have afforded such a thing. So in some strange way, the first folio was the beginning of this concept that Shakespeare was for elites, even though he wasn't. You really, you had to be wealthy to be able to have a one of those folio editions. It's an interesting point. I think it kind of signifies that shift from performative text to poetic text, doesn't it? So it's text to be read. It's kind of being appreciated as a text rather than as a performance. I think you're right there. Tony, you bring something up. Are you touching on something there that's really interesting? Is Danielle mentioned earlier the quarto editions of Shakespeare's plays or other plays, and then we're talking about a folio edition now. And obviously when scholars or, or um, Arden Shakespeare or Penguin develop their version to the scripts, they look at all of them, the quartos. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between a quarto publication and a folio publication and what the physical process of both of them were? The essential difference is size. So a folio is the largest size book that uh, could be produced at the time. And that was made by taking a sheet of paper. Uh, so you would print two pages on each side, four printed pages in total. And then you fold that piece of paper once down the middle to give you your spine fold and essentially a little booklet. So the whole sheet of paper is folded once in half. Um, that then gets bound with multiple sheets of paper into a large book. Obviously, that's very expensive because you've got four pages out of one sheet of paper. Paper's imported during this period. It's taxed. It's an expensive thing to, to import. Much more efficient is to make a quarto. So in a quarto, instead of folding your piece of paper once, you fold it twice. So you can get eight printed pages on one sheet of paper. So you're saving costs, you're making a smaller book, then when it goes to the binder, they're using less material. It's a more manageable book, certainly, not quite pocket size, but certainly portable. Whereas a folio is a grand work that sits on a shelf and it's quite a statement, as Daniel was saying. It's a big financial investment for everyone involved. It's a big risk for those producing it. And um, I think for Shakespeare's work to be in a folio format is no accident. Yeah, that, that is definitely a statement. So would the statement there be that essentially it's a kind of indication of the regard that Shakespeare was held in? Is that correct? If you wanted that on your bookshelf, that indicated that or rather like having a Picasso or a, a Dali. It's a statement of how prominent and important Shakespeare was seen culturally at that time. I wonder if it's a statement from those who produced the folio. So um, Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the preliminary pages talk about uh, from the perspective of those gathering together the text. Uh, it, it was very much an appreciation of Shakespeare, wasn't it? Absolutely. And I think what's really interesting is that on the title page, they talk about, you know, these plays having been edited from true original copies. And I think what we might well see here is a reputation being built as much as being consolidated. So yes, he was a well-known actor and, and, and playwright, but I think the folio really helped to lift him up a slightly higher level with the folio, as Tony was saying, you know, the folio being such a prestige object, it kind of 
sealed his reputation as a playwright for the elite classes of England. We talked a little bit about who might have bought the first folio edition and who would have bought the quartos. That's a really good question. I think the folio was definitely limited to people who could afford it, people who did have a lot of disposable income and could afford to spend a pound on, on a bound book. Um, quartos would have had a slightly wider readership, but that would have also included the elite. So we know that for example, John Cousin, who bought a copy of the Upper First Folio and later brought it to Durham when he became Bishop of Durham, um, he also had quarto play texts. We no longer have those, unfortunately, but you know we know from surviving evidence of the time that he was certainly interested in theatre and in dramatic works and would buy them in quarto or in folio. Picking up again on some points that you've both made about consolidating and also creating the reputation of Shakespeare and the idea that very much the people who came together to create the folio were obviously had some kind of goal in mind. 750 copies is a big run, isn't it? <laughs> And um, how many of those survived? Do we have a rough idea? I believe the number's 235 that are known. That number very slowly increases as the years go on. It's not that unusual for new copies to surface. Over the years, first folios have been uh, held in high regard. And what that's meant is they've been rebound a number of times. Perhaps they've been split into separate works. So it's not unheard of that new ones come to light. So the largest single collection is at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington. And is it something in the region of 80 copies there, Danielle? I think that's right. It's 82, I think, is, is the full number. So yes, they hold the world record, I think, <laughs> uh, by far. And the first folio is known as the first folio because it was the first folio. There were subsequent folios. Why were there subsequent folios and how do they differ? Did they evolve or was it just different prints of the same text? They do evolve somewhat. Certainly at the time, it was thought that the third folio was of a better quality than the first folio in terms of, of editing practices. It also included more plays. It was essentially a matter of a print run run out, so a book sold out, so you would then reprint if the demand was there. So by the time you get to the second folio in 1632, there was clearly the idea that there was a demand for more folios. I don't think the second folio sold terribly well because it then was not until the early 1660s that the third folio came out. So there was quite a big gap. So between 1623 and 1632, it's only a few years. Then between 1632 and I think it was 1663, that's the gap between the second and the third folio. Then you get the fourth folio, which is really the last large edition that gets published because when you then get into the 18th century, again, we go back to a slightly more portable format. The editions are published in multiple volumes, but then at a smaller size, even than the quarto format that you would have seen originally. And presumably that reflected the fact that, that already these texts were going into the kind of literary and cultural bloodstream. More and more people were reading them and therefore there was more and more of a demand. So there was a supply and demand issue. So it became easier and easier and more important to, to circulate them. Because we know that Milton read Shakespeare, I think. Would he have read the early folios? I think, did they not find a, a first folio with his annotations in it recently? Um, I don't know terribly much about that particular copy, but yes, that was that was certainly quite an interesting discovery. <laughs> scribbling on a first folio. That's quite an interesting one. Two great English writers interacting with each other in a, on a piece of paper. Oh, definitely. Other than Ben Johnson, who self-published, there isn't anyone else whose work was pu published in folio in this way. Is that right, from the time? Um, don't quote me on this, but I don't think so. Tony, I don't know if you know the answer to this, that something like um, The Fairy Queen, the Ed Edmund Spencer epic poem, was that printed in folio? Because that was pretty enormous. So, yes, the first folio, the Durham first folio, um, has been in Bishop Cousins Library since uh, it was built in 1669, as Daniel described. And um, it remained um, in the library. Um, it's, it's the first folio of the longest continual ownership and also sort of it's been in the same physical location for the longest period of time. Um, we know it did spend some time at uh, Durham Cathedral, um, about 1900, it was there for a bit. Um, but essentially, it's been part of that same collection. Uh, it's not been sold. It's not moved into a different building. Um, it, it's been there for uh, the longest time, all the first folios. Um, also, as we might consider the Cousins Library to be a public library to some extent, we think it's probably the... Um, only copy to be on public access of some form for that length of time. 
And of course, in, in more recent years, it's had more of a turbulent history. So in 1998, it was stolen from Cousins Library and returned 10 years later. So the first folio uh, resurfaced at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., uh, where it was brought in for authentication. Uh, after some investigations, some really fascinating investigations, it was proved to be the missing Durham copy. And then it was returned to the university um, in 2008. And since then, it's um, it's been on site at Palace Green Library in secure storage. So it's been at the Cousins Library since 2008, did you say? The recovery and the proving of its identity is a really interesting story. And actually, it shows us a lot about how books were made. So this first folio that got handed at the Folger Library uh, was missing a lot of its identifying features. So it was missing its binding entirely. So the leather, the boards were all missing, and it was missing a lot of its beginning and end leaves. So the title page, any leaves that had really easily identifiable features like annotations or ownership marks was all missing. So the book that appeared at the Folger was just the, what we call the text block. So literally the block of the pages that make up the center of the book. Luckily, because first folios are so highly regarded and objects of fascination, we have incredibly detailed records on the Durham first folio. So beyond the most easily identifiable features, we know about small little variants in the press of it. So um, when changes were made to spelling or numbering, as the printing process went on, we know exactly what variants we have in the Durham copy, which isn't quite a fingerprint, but certainly it is specific to that copy, as well as lots of other little features like little bits of damage or annotation throughout the book. So there was quite a forensic examination of this first volume that appeared and by looking at it and comparing it to what we knew about the Durham copy it was possible to prove this is the Durham copy and then it was returned to the university. It's absolutely fascinating. Well it's a great honour from Elysium's point of view to be able to be presenting these two Shakespeare plays commemorating this 400th anniversary and also performing it right next to the library in which the Durham copy is held. Summing up, would either of you like to say something, or both of you like to say something about why this copy is important, why the folio is important? Danielle, you talked about its significance as a book. Perhaps you'd just like to sum up something there. Why is it significant as a book? It's significant for multiple reasons. First of all, without the first folio, 18 of the plays contained within it would, would have been lost to us. So we wouldn't have had Macbeth, for example. And so it's a really important source for Shakespeare scholars, for their editions, for their understanding of theatre at the time. Even the plays that we do have earlier editions for in, in quarto format, such as Midsummer Night's Dream, which appeared in, in two quartos before the first folio, you know, there are significant differences between the text contained in those quartos and the text contained in the folio. And this gives scholars a really good insight into how plays may have developed or how they were interpreted subsequently in, in performances. So textually, it is a really important book. For a book historical point of view, um, it's really interesting from, you know, as, as Tony indicated, you know, each of these folios is unique in its own right. The text on the surface may be the same, but there are really subtle differences. And it was only because of, of recording those differences that it was possible to identify um, the Durham first folio as the Durham first folio. Um, and then, of course, there's this idea of, of Shakespeare as this cultural icon. And I think the first folio gives us something of a connection. For most people, it's, it's kind of the closest they can get to Shakespeare's time to the poet playwright himself. So it's a really important book from for a kind of a cultural history point of view. Well, also from my professional's point of view, from the theatre, removing plays like Macbeth from from the world canon is, is is quite a dramatic loss. And certainly, the fact that Shakespeare is so all pervasive, not just in this country but the whole world, in its literature and how we talk about things, the idea that without the first folio, a huge amount of that would be have been forgotten forever is is a fairly astonishing piece of information. Tony, what about you? How would you summarise the significance of the folio? Well, I think if we just think about the Durham first folio and its significance, I mean, I'm very interested in it, its physical nature and what that reflects in terms of attitudes towards Shakespeare and uh, attitudes towards books, actually. So we know the Durham copy was rebound in about 1840. So uh, a more elaborate binding was put on it, perhaps reflecting during that time, uh, a greater reverence for the book and the desire to do the best by it, by um, putting gold on it and making it a little bit more more showy. 
all the way through to, to its more modern, more turbulent history, that this is an object of desire and uh, people go to great lengths to, to possess one. Talking to people about this book, what comes through is, I think, the local significance. You know, this is Durham's first folio. It's been here for 350 years or so. Uh, it's never moved except for recent years. And, uh, and that does mean something. And I think the act of having it taken away for those 10 years just underlined that. And I think stopping to consider how the first folio is now physically. So it, it is a damaged book. And when you're in the presence of people seeing it for the first time in its state that it is now, so it, it is damaged, it's missing its covers, it is very vulnerable. Um, a lot of people have quite a, a dramatic kind of uh, gut reaction to seeing what has been described as almost a, a secular relic that has been intentionally vandalized throws up all sorts of really interesting questions about what that means. I mean, this is a, a printed book. There are a few hundred other copies of this book in existence, but there isn't another Durham copy. You know, what does it mean to, to damage something like this? And how do you care for that going forward? It throws up all sorts of really fascinating questions. Well, yes, I mean, the two things that spring to mind there is one, the, the very charged and powerful position that Shakespeare holds in our psyches, in our cultural minds. But also the, the reality that it's something that Durham itself should be very proud of. So this is something very special. I may be wrong, but I, I'm not sure many of the other folios are in the same place for such a long time. This is part of Durham's heritage. It's part of the heritage of the city, the county, and presumably the Northeast in general. Um, and I think um, there should be a lot of pride in that. Well, Tony, Danielle, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. Absolutely fascinating. As a theatre director who thought you knew a lot about Shakespeare, it's absolutely fascinating to learn all these things about the physical reality of this book and its cultural reality and its significance. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. That was Tony King and Danielle Westerhoff sharing with us their knowledge of the first folio and its history. To find out more about the Durham Shakespeare Festival 2023, go to our website, www.elysiumtc.co.uk.